can show any, share any joy or concern that you'd like shared aloud with the congregation during the service. And as always, those of you here in the sanctuary can add a joy or concern in our physical book of life, just behind Kevin, seated at the piano there. And if you'd like to get to know us better, we encourage you to join us for a physical coffee hour in the pavilion, just behind our sliding doors to my right, or um, in a breakout room for a virtual coffee hour on Zoom. And so the, this month, the theme for our services is reconciliation, a word that conjures up associations with reunion, reciprocity, maybe contrition, and certainly forgiveness. In today's service, our settled minister, Reverend Matthew McHale, will look at the theme of reconciliation in part through the lens of our universalist heritage. I've already referred to Unitarian Universalism as a single faith community during this welcome, but it wasn't always such. In fact, I'm about a year older than the merger between the American Unitarian Association and the Universalist Church of America. Growing up in a Unitarian family, I had virtually no awareness of Universalism, even a decade or more after the formation of the Unitarian Universalist Association. My family attended Unitarian churches, or sometimes societies or fellowships. As Unitarians, we hung our hat on our general rejection of a divine nature for Jesus. More broadly, Unitarianism, in my experience, came to refer as much to a a belief that all persons participated in a union of divine nature in the universe as to this historical rejection of the divinity of Jesus. Meanwhile, I had a vague notion that the Universalists thought everyone was saved, which was nice if you weren't an atheistic Unitarian like me who didn't believe in a God, loving or otherwise, and hence not in salvation or even an afterlife. But that is to sell universalism far short of its importance and the depths of its theological heritage. Maybe more than the pervasive humanist orientation of Unitarianism, universalism does not merely affirm that all persons have inherent worth, but it follows that they are equally worthy of divine love and forgiveness showing that our Unitarian Universalist first principle is not just a good idea, it has an important outcome. But before we get any deeper into that, we're gonna take time in a moment to introduce ourselves, greet our neighbors. For those of you on Zoom, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, especially if you're new. And now in the spirit of welcome, let's take a moment to greet our neighbors and feel free to take this opportunity to add anything you'd like to our book of life. Hey, how you doing? Good. Good seeing you.
you doing? Good to see you. Oh, thank you very much. I know my voice is not warmed up. I might have to transpose everything down for us. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Reverend Matthew McHale, and my pronouns are he and him. So this morning, I'm going to tell you a story about when saying sorry isn't enough. This story begins with a family, and in the family, there were two dads, four kids, and a grandma. Now, most evenings after dinner, their dads and grandma had chores to do around the house and bills to pay, and sometimes they had errands to run. So the kids often had to entertain themselves. And most of those evenings, the way they most liked to entertain themselves was to go outside and play basketball. But by the end of autumn, it had started to get dark before dinner was even over, and it was getting cold outside at night, and some evenings it even rained. And Grandma finally said, you kids are going to have to find something else to do inside until after dinner until it gets warmer again. And so after a few boring nights inside, the oldest brother went and found a cardboard box big enough that the basketball would fit inside of it. Let's play basketball inside tonight. We can shoot baskets into the box. But the youngest sister was worried about this setup. So she said to her siblings, you know, I'd love to play basketball inside tonight, but I'm worried that if we play inside, we might end up breaking something. The middle, the middle two kids looked at her, and then they looked at their older brother, who said, oh, stop worrying about nothing. It's going to be fine. If we're careful, we won't break anything. When the youngest sister started to protest again, the older brother said loudly, well, I'm the oldest, and this is what we're doing. If you don't like it, you can go do something else. Fine, said youngest sister, and they began to play. What do you think happened next? Well, Things went fine with their basketball game in the house until the oldest brother knocked the ball out of his younger brother's hand and it shot sideways right into the bookshelf. And it broke the little vase that the youngest sister had made in art class for their dads for Father's Day. The youngest sister was furious. I warned you this would happen, but you didn't listen to me because I'm the youngest, but I was right. And she kneeled down to begin cleaning up the pieces of the vase. Oldest brother felt bad. She had been right, and because of him, the vase that she, so, that she made so carefully for their fathers had been broken. I'm sorry, sister, he said but she didn't say anything back to him. I know you're upset, he said to her after a few minutes of silence, but it's not like I meant for this to happen. I only wanted us to all have fun together tonight. I had the best of intentions. I know you did, replied Grandma, who had brought a broom and a dustpan to help the youngest sister clean up the broken vase but your impact matters more than your intentions. Being sorry is only a feeling. It won't fix your sister's vase. You need to do more than say you're sorry. You need to try and make things right again. Okay, said the oldest brother. I guess I'll start by telling daddy and papa why their vase is broken and I think tonight, I'll think tonight about what I might do for youngest sister to try and make things right between us again.
that's the end of our story this morning. And so I hope this story helps us all to remember that feeling bad about mistakes we all, that we've made and saying sorry for them sometimes isn't enough on their own. Sometimes what those we've harmed or hurt need isn't for us to feel bad, but to make things right. And so may we all have the humility and courage to make things right when and where we can. Before our children go off to the religious education program, I'd like us to join in saying together our Unitarian Universalist affirmation together. And you can join me in the hand signals. We are Unitarian Universalists, a people of open minds, loving hearts, and welcoming hands. And now we have for our, as during these few months while we're in the middle of our stewardship campaign, we're hearing testimonials from members of the congregation of why this church is important to them and why they support it. And this morning we have pleased to have Susan Siskin Good morning. I'm so happy to be here and being asked to do this today. Um, I, uh, st I, the first time I ever came to Emerson was before the earthquake. We had a different building, and I came for a La Leche League um, meeting, um, which is a breastfeeding organization, a support group. And um, the, the religious education director was also a La Leche League leader, and um, from that moment on, I looked around and I thought this place looks really interesting and um, so I joined in 1990 and I've been a member ever since. Um, the reason that I joined was primarily because I had a three-year-old daughter, Sarah, who um, we wanted to have some spiritual enrichment and um, my husband was raised Jewish and I was uh, kind of a traumatized Catholic and so we were looking for something else and we found a safe, encouraging intellectual and spiritual home here. Um, I remember real early on hearing the expression that Emerson can take you from cradle to grave. And I found that really comforting, and it has been literally true for me, <laughs> for my family. I had two more children here. They've all been um, through their child dedication ceremonies and all through the RE program. I taught RE for about 15 years. And my son was luckily the right age to do the OWL program at the time, and um, I thought was, I think that's a really beneficial program if anybody ever gets a chance to do it. Um, my husband, Bert, was 25 years my senior, and so um, he obviously passed, um, he passed about six and a half years ago. We had a beautiful ceremony here, a beautiful memorial for him here, and it still supports and sustains me. Um, I think it was Matthew's first memorial here <laughs> at Emerson. Um, <clears throat> So those were just, I mean, I could talk about benefits of, of being here all day, but I'll make it pretty short. Um, I, I'm really an extrovert, and I almost never missed a Sunday before the pandemic. Um, I enjoyed music here. Um, my daughter, Molly, my middle daughter, sang in the choir. I've been to plays here. Um, I remember uh, we did the vagina monologues, and I, I think Reverend Ann was even in in the play, I'm not sure. Um, we did the play eight, and that was really exciting because the two people who were in the the lawsuit lived in Burbank, and so they they came and did a Q and A after the play. That was amazing. Um, so many things that happened here. This has really been a vibrant, amazing community. Um, I'm going to plug your date with Death Club, <laughs> which is tomorrow. It's just amazing. Um, if you get a chance to do any of them, they're they're wonderful. Um, <clears throat> so then um, the pandemic happened, and the first Sunday I was so incredibly grateful that we did not miss a beat, and Matthew got us right up on Zoom, which none of us had ever heard of then. <laughs> now we all, it's just second nature, but um, it was so wonderful to see my church family on camera and to get to see everybody's living rooms and to see smiling faces. We could see people without masks. 
Um, my daughter Molly was in New York City. This was way before the vaccine. Both of her roommates had, co had, been expo had COVID actually. And it was just a terrifying time. She couldn't come home. We couldn't go there. Um, so it was, it was just so wonderful to have Zoom, to, to have people you know, there with me. Um, I, I run a dog business, a dog uh, care business, and it's seven days a week, basically. I have seven doggies at home waiting for me. So I'm especially busy on Sundays, and I, I'm only getting here about once a month, but I'm going to try and get back. It's wonderful to be here in person. There's nothing like it. But if you can't do that, Zoom is an amazing alternative. Um, I remember seeing Iris um, Edinger and Pat Lindenauer in their last uh, days, their last Sundays, and it was wonderful to see them know that they were on Zoom and hearing, hearing church with us. Um, so Melissa and Marot and I are always talking about how can we get people to come? This is like the best kept secret in the world. Why are more people here? And it's so hard to get people to come. But I think it's not that hard to get people to come on Zoom. So I'm really encouraging everybody out there in Zoom land to um, get people to come <laughs> and check it out. Um, actually, my, my sister Janet, my twin sister, is probably on Zoom. Hi, Janet. I get to see her every Sunday <laughs> now, and I, she lives in Central California, so it's, that's another treat for me. Um, <clears throat> So anyway, I am upping my pledge this year because I'm thinking about all the gas I saved in this last three years not coming to church. <laughs> and um, I, 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 just, uh, I just hope we can get back to our, the vitality that we have always had. So thank you. Each week we share the plate, split the plate with an organization in the community that we think is doing good work and which furthers our mission. And so each month we have a different recipient. This month's recipient is Refugee Children's Center, uh, which is in North Hills. And the Refugee Children's Center was founded a few years ago in response to the number of children uh, fleeing violence uh, in Central America, particularly um, El Salvador and Guatemala. And um, the, the Refugee Children's Center seeks to be a place that offers a warm and loving embrace to people who have fled everything and have experienced threats and violence, sometimes to their family members. Um, and to surround them with love and also to provide lots of resources and support, legal resources, support with food and also counseling, finding community, all, all kinds of opportunities to build a healthy, strong life and heal from uh, their experiences beforehand. So I invite you as the plate goes around to give generous, generously, if you're joining us online or if you're paying uh, online, you can go to uh, donate.emersonuuc.org or use the Vanco mobile app uh, and select um, Sunday offering. And if you are, if you're writing a check, please write, uh, share the plate in the memo. Our offering will now be gratefully received.
Each Sunday in our service, we take time to lift up the joys and sorrows from within our community and in the wider world. This week in our book of life, Susan Siskin, who we just heard from, shares that sadly, her dear friend Kim Clark lost her four-year struggle with lung cancer. Rest in peace, sweet soul. Lucas writes, I want to share with you, my family, ever since attending and joining you in unity, the feeling of belonging community is a blessing I have longed for. And in our virtual book of life, uh, Nicole writes, a joy that I have been enjoying gardening on Tuesdays with Eric and Reverend Matthew. It's a reminder, Tuesdays, 1030. Uh, <laughs> she says, come join us out here in the garden. And uh, Deb writes, <laughs> 10 more days until I get to see the man I love, Todd Covert. <laughs> um, and start our move into our new home. So. <laughs> Do you feel on, the, feel on the spot, Todd? <laughs> and going out to the wider world We lift up yet another shooting after so many. I feel like with more than one per day so far this year, I could be saying it every week. And yet our heart breaks, our hearts break each time. In a moment, I'm going to sound this singing bowl. And after I do, I invite you to speak into this space any joys or sorrows, any names or occasions that are on your heart this morning. If you're on Zoom, I invite you to type it into the chat as we lift them up into this, our embracing meditation. all that has been shared and all that we hold in the silent sanctuary of our hearts, we offer these into the embrace of this beloved community. I invite you now to join me in a spirit of meditation or prayer. Just find a comfortable spot, position, dropping down into this moment, finding your breath, maybe closing your eyes or softening your gaze, just being present in the moment. All our lives we have been told to seek that which is good to turn our faces from the dark and toward the light, toward beauty, toward truth. But the truth is that the world is not always good. 
The light we seek casts shadows, and there is brokenness amid the beauty. Our world is far from perfect, and so are we. We strive to be in right relations with one another, but there are times when we are left angry or disappointed, even as we sometimes anger or disappoint others. Whether it is the harsh words said by a loved one, the loss of a friendship, the carelessness of a stranger, or the scars left by a childhood trauma, bad things do happen. We cannot seek truth, beauty, and light without acknowledging and affirming that which is false, broken, and in shadow. For all of these exist within us as well. <clears throat> as we enter into a moment of silence, let us remember the wrongs we have endured, the imperfections that we have perpetuated, that we may forgive them and ourselves and forgive yet again. Amen, Ashe, blessed be. Join me in singing, There is a Love. There is a love holding me. There is a love holding all that I love. There This reading is by Hannah Roberts Villeneuve. Hopefully I'm not butchering her last name. Back in Baltimore, one day we were looking for parking at some hip new bar. And we passed a church, Presbyterian I think, that had a sign that read, I think, good thing church isn't for perfect people because if it were, you wouldn't be welcome. Good thing church isn't for perfect people, because I wouldn't be here if that was the case. 
because you wouldn't be here if that were the case, because we wouldn't be here if that were the case. If that were the case, church would sit empty 24 hours and seven days waiting for the person whose life has been nothing but perfection. No strife, no heartbreak, no mistakes, no failure. Thank God for the truth that under this roof, there is room for my heart, for your heart our hearts, which have been broken apart by the world, yes, but by our own words and deeds too. Thank God for the truth that under this roof there is room for my mistakes, your heartache, our abandoned dreams. Thank God for the truth that under this roof there is room for humanity, for wholeness, for holiness, none of which is perfect. And now I invite you to join in singing the hymn uh, number 1029 in your teal hymnal, Love Knocks and Waits for Us to Hear. This is probably a, a song that is maybe unfamiliar, so I'll just invite Kevin to play it through uh, one, once through all the way. and waits for us to hear, to open and invite. Love longs to quiet every fear and seeks to set things right. Love offers life in spite of foes who threaten and condemn. And embracing enemies, love goes the second mile with them. Love comes to heal the broken heart, to ease the troubled mind. With our word, love bids us start to ask and seek and find. Love knocks and enters at the sound of welcome from within. Love sings and dances all around and feels a new life need. Our second reading is the parable of the prodigal son from the Gospel of Luke. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that falls to me. And he divided his living between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took his journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in loose living. And when he had spent everything, a great famine arose in that country, and he began to be in want. So he went and joined himself to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. And he would have gladly fed on the food that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. Then he understood and said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and went to his father. 
But while he was yet at a distance, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and embraced and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fat calf and kill it and let us eat and make merry. For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to make merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what this meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father, your father has killed the fat calf because he has received him safe and sound. But the elder son was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he, he answered his father, Lo, these many years I have served you. I have served you and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me even a goat that I might make merry with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your living with prostitutes, you killed for him a fat calf. And the father said to him, Son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is now alive. He was lost and is found. This morning we have a musical offering. as a song called What Forgiveness Is by the band Sidewalk Prophets. It's a video. Thought that I was right Knew that you were wrong I chose the upper hand Over open hands Bitterness over understand Now there's rooms in my heart Under lock and key Where I kept an honest love And all my trust from the hurt So long 
those little things on the bottom really enhances the video. The parable of the prodigal son is one of the stories that Jesus tells to his followers. It's a story of forgiveness, of redemption, and grace. And it seems that one of the main takeaways from the story is just how important the practice of forgiveness is in holding together family and, and society more broadly and holding them together. But more than just a story about forgiveness and reconciliation between a father and a son, biblical scholars have suggested that the parable is an allegory about the relationship between God and humanity, where the forgiving father represents God. And that forgiving God sounds an awful lot like a universalist God, which Todd was talking about earlier. Universalism comes from the belief in universal salvation, the idea that through the endless love and mercy of the divine, all people would eventually be saved or reconciled to God, no matter what they had done in their lives. And so universalism has been present in Christianity since its earliest years, even after the, er- even after the early church fathers declared it a heresy. The American Universalist Movement, which is part of our Unitarian Universalist heritage, started emerging first in the years leading up to the American Revolution, at a time when they were revivalist ministers roaming the countrysides preaching fire and brimstone sermons, that preaching that most people were sinners and, that, and would be damned to hell for eternity for their sinful ways. You may be familiar with the most famous of at least these sermon titles, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. On the op- on, so the Universalists were on the exact opposite end of the spectrum. The Universalist message preached by people like the minister George Murray and evangelist George de Beneville was a radical message, even heretical for its time that God was compassionate and forgiving, not punitive and judgmental, and that meant that everyone would be restored to God's grace. And so we see that sort of deep redeeming love in the story of the prodigal son, right, where the father immediately forgives his son. And so in the parable, as the younger son contemplates his return, he resolves to repent and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. But as soon as his father sees him, as soon as he sees the bedraggled state he's in, bedraggled and malnourished, the father is instantly filled with compassion for his son before his son has even had a chance to apologize to him and runs to him and gives him a big loving embrace. When the son does begin to apologize, the father doesn't even let him finish his apology and instead calls for a massive feast. He is so happy to have his son back. And honestly, even without a boundless love and compassion that God, that God might be capable of, I expect most parents would have the same reaction if something similar happened with their child. So powerful is that parental love for someone who you raised as a baby, who you have known and cared for all of your life, that we would be able to forgive a lot. We all make mistakes, have moments of recklessness or poor judgment. And yet the Father's example of unconditional love and forgiveness shows us that no one is beyond redemption. You know, although the text doesn't have anything to say about it, I can't help but wonder if perhaps the father in the story might feel such a sense of relief to see his son again, to know that he is alive because he has felt guilty too. 
I can imagine him spending those years after his son left, agonizing over what mistakes he made as a parent that caused his son to want to leave in the first place. Wondered what he could have done differently. So perhaps the, the return of his son is a second chance for him too. But one of the things that I still find jarring is that the story makes no mention of any sort of remediation or restitution that the son makes. Should forgiveness come so easily? The Catholic and Jewish traditions both strongly emphasize the importance of seeking forgiveness from God with sincerity and commitment. For Catholics, obtaining God's forgiveness requires a three-step process feeling contrite, confessing wrongdoing to a priest, and then taking action as prescribed by the priest. In the Jewish tradition, seeking forgiveness involves feeling remorse, making restitution and renewing one's relationship with God, and after, only after these steps have been taken, then one asks, can ask for forgiveness from the person who has been wrong before then seeking forgiveness from God. And it is through engaging in this practice with honest commitment that one can become a better person. You know, so important in the Jewish tradition is that the highest of holy days, Yom Kippur, is about that very thing. It's a day of atonement. So was it right for the father to forgive so easily? I'll come back to that question in a second. But what the parable makes clear is that the older brother, who is resentful of his younger brother, who went off and squandered all of his money while while the older brother stayed and worked hard, hard and was devoted to his father and never received anything for it, he is resentful of his younger brother. He does not wish to join in the celebration. And... To me, it's fairly clear that the parable is telling us that this older brother is in the wrong. His father entreats him to offer forgiveness. This, in the, in the parable, this is also, scholars would say, this is a stand-in for um, the Pharisees who were judgmental of people like tax, tax collectors and prostitutes and other sinners. And so Jesus's message was, no, these people are holy too and in need of love and compassion. And so that was his rebuke to these priests themselves. And the reality is though that, I mean, clearly forgiveness is important and it's a necessary practice. And it's not really just for the other person. In fact, it's more for ourselves. I'm sure you probably already know this, so I won't belabor the point, but forgiveness is ultimately about freeing ourselves from the heavy burden of anger and resentment. Forgiveness is not about ignoring or minimizing harm that has been done. Rather, it is about acknowledging the pain and choosing to let go of the negative emotions that can keep us trapped in a cycle of anger and resentment and bitterness. When we forgive someone who has wronged us, we release our emotions from the burden. We release ourselves from the burden of those negative emotions. And it should be said that forgiveness does not necessarily need to involve reconciliation. They are, they are related, but they are two different things. And so I want to talk a little bit about reconciliation. Paula Cole Jones writes, when we engage in reconciliation, we invite change that will transform a relationship. Apology alone is not enough to achieve reconciliation. In fact, it may do more to relieve the burden of the person who caused the injury than it does for the injured party. Apology followed by forgiveness can be an act of generosity, but still may not complete the work of establishing a sense of trust. 
Reconciliation, the dictionary definition is to restore friendship or harmony or to settle or resolve differences. Reconciliation transforms both parties by bringing them to a new consciousness about the way they see, treat, and represent each other. And so reconciliation takes work, it takes effort, it takes it takes action to do something to repair that harm. Now, the early universalists believed that those who were sinful might still have to experience some sort of punishment after they died, and it was only after experiencing suffering and, more importantly, repentance that they would get to go to heaven. But there was differences among the universalists and Hosea Ballou, who was also a minister who would catalyze the universalist movement in America, become its strongest leader, preached that no one went to hell and that any torment and agony that those who were sinful, as, he would have, as they would have thought of it, any torment and agony would have been experienced here on earth. That was the punishment. What we experienced in earth was a punishment and not in some afterlife. And we can see that in the experience of the prodigal son who suffers greatly after he leaves his family, working, working out, taking care, of the field, taking care of the pigs in the fields, which, you know, for someone who is Jewish would be an especially degrading task, having to work with pigs who are considered unclean and, of course, not having enough to eat. And he also lives with the guilt and shame for the pain he caused to his father. The Reverend Davidson Lore sought to go deeper into this story by writing a soliloquy from the perspective of the younger son, and I share a brief excerpt from it. Don't envy me. You hear the story from outside of my life, outside of my skin, and you think it's just a lovely tale, a free gift, a story for the children, something to wrap candy in. But from inside, it is a torment, a torment in need of a resolution that I don't know how to find. To nearly everyone hearing this tale, it will sound like the story of a young fool who got away with it, who had his cake and ate it too. But can you imagine trying to live surrounded by relatives friends and neighbors who look at you like a good for nothing. They think I'm a brat whose soft-minded father has cheated both my brother and the whole idea of justice. When we seek out to see people who have harmed us to offer forgiveness. We may be able to see them not just for their mistakes and faults, but as whole individuals with their own struggles and challenges, with our own struggles and challenges. And so reconciliation can be a powerful transformation. And sometimes I wonder, you know, the story ends with the party. It doesn't say what comes after, but Maybe some conversation does come after, some conversation necessary, required to do some healing, required to do some forgiving, not just of the prodigal son, but perhaps for his father and his older brother, who I'm sure had a part to play in his younger brother running off as well. It stands to reason. And so relationships often require that all parties do some forgiving. The minister, Scott Alexander, writes about one such occasion of forgiveness, of an estrangement with a friend. I cared enough about the relationship and found enough courage within to arrange for a confrontation between the two of us. Not a nasty one-way confrontation where I spewed out my anger toward him, but a creative healing dialogue where first I said how hurt and angry I was, and then together we engaged in genuine conversation about his feelings and perspectives and how together we might close the painful breach between us. 
Let me tell you that this process leading to forgiveness was uncomfortable for both of us. He acknowledged his betrayal and disloyalty, but as I listened to his own hurt feelings, I also faced ways in which I had contributed to the weakening of our friendship and stood myself in need of forgiveness. Now, I'm not asking you to be the universalist God who blanketly offers forgiveness and reconciliation. We are not God if we even if we believe in God at all. We are merely human and we may not have endless compassion and resources to give. There may be limits to what we are willing to forgive. Hurts that were too big, too powerful to get past. Maybe one might offer a second chance, but what if the trust is broken again and again? Is there a third chance, a fourth chance, a tenth chance? I don't claim to know the answer. It depends on the situation. But it does raise the question of how much we are willing to offer because part of that reconciliation does require a commitment to change, to not only make restitution, but to try to change and to make an honest commitment to it, not something superficial. And so I hope in this parable of the prodigal son, that there is some reconciliation, some growth in all parts. And that we may find that too in our lives, challenging though it may be, uncomfortable though it may be at times, we know that holding on to that anger and resentment can be a far worse poison sometimes than the original affront caused. And so I want to close with some advice from the Reverend Stephanie Nichols. The invitation of this parable, she says, is to never give up on home, to stay in relationship with those people and those parts of yourself that have been lost, and to remain ready to rejoice when someone or something that has been lost is found again. It is an invitation to live with open arms rather than with clenched teeth. May it be so. I want to thank everyone who helped make this service possible to Todd Covert, our worship associate, Kevin Matthew, our music director, to Linda Morris out on the welcome table, to the folks up in our tech booth this morning, our ushers, people who have helped set up for our, our first Sunday potluck, which will be happening immediately after the service, and those of you who uh, have not yet helped but will help by cleaning up after the service. <laughs> Um, all of that is greatly appreciated. Another uh, just quick announcement. We have the um, Date with Death Club, which Susan mentioned in her testimonial. It's the third meeting of that happening tomorrow at the Canoga Park Branch Library. Um, once a month, we're meeting to explore death and this, this month's topic, tomorrow's topic at, uh, at three o'clock is owning your dying. So that's a, it's a come one, come Come to one, come to some, or come to all. So if you haven't been before, there's no problem. And, and then finally, we have our Inquirer series, uh, which will start around one o'clock, both in the minister's office and on Zoom for those who are new to uh, Unitarian Universalism and want to learn more about it. It's our monthly series. So I invite you to, to just check in with me, to talk to me if you're interested in participating or just stay uh, on, this, on this Zoom room. And now I invite you to join in singing our closing hymn, uh, Please Rise in Body or in Spirit, as we sing Break Not the Circle, number 323. Forgive me. 
Bring not the circle, make it wider still, till it includes embraces all the living. Come wonder at this love that comes to life, where words of freedom are with humor spoken. When people keep no score of wrong or guilt, but will that human bonds remain unbroken? Join then the movement of the love that frees, till people of whatever race or nation will truly be themselves and stand on their feet, see eye to eye with laughter and elation. I invite you to remain risen as we extinguish our chalice and for our benediction words. I invite you to reach out and take a hand if you feel comfortable or t touch shoulders, touch, uh, touch uh, bump elbows. For those of you joining on Zoom, I invite you to send some energy to us and to each other on Zoom as we send it back to you. I offer you these words from the Reverend Frederick Gillis. May the love that overcomes all differences, that heals all wounds, that puts to flight all fears, that reconciles all who are separated, be in us and among us, now and always. Amen. Ashe. Blessed be.